think this is working. Is it working? Oof. All right, welcome to the Uncolored Podcast. I'm Kevin Metcalf. Um, I'm going to try and make this work. This is like the fourth time I've tried this. And I keep looking at it in post, and I'm like, this is not going to work, so I have to do it over again. So hopefully this one will work. I've cut it down from what it is, and I'm just going to have to make different blocks. I tried to, It's a big topic, and I tried to do it all at once, or at least a big part of it at once in a big overview. Uh, there's, just, there's just so many ways to go at this idea. Uh, it's, it'll be better if I just go piece by piece and slow it down. I, I was trying to do too much. It looked like I was rambling, like, like most of the time. Maybe I was just rambling. Uh, but welcome to the podcast. So what we're going to do is go over again what I think are good ideas and what I think are bad ideas. Um, we spent a lot of time going over uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Rasmussen's book, How Reason Can Lead to God, because I think that his idea in that book is a fantastic idea. Um, and it's not necessarily an idea that he came up with necessarily, although you know he's working on it in kind of his own way, presenting in his own fashion. But the basic idea is that at the foundation of everything, or should I say, everything you see must have some sort of a foundation for its existence. And that's a, I think that's something like either the, the Leibnizian ar, ar, uh, argument for the existence of God, or, or it might be, a, I think uh, Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas had, had this idea that everything exists kind of like in a static, not in a static thing, but a moment-by-moment moment existence. But anyway... What Dr. Rasmussen was working on is this idea that for everything to exist, there has to be something that imparts existence onto the idea. And it's a very big idea. Uh, but I think the way he goes about it is indicative of the way people talk about really, really good ideas. And so not only do I think that as I've been looking at you know, this for the past several years, you know, just ideas in general, philosophy, theology, those kinds of things, it seems as though good ideas have very particular characteristics uh, that are characteristic to those good ideas. But also bad ideas seem to have characteristics that are particular to bad ideas. Um, and so one of the things that I'm hoping to do is to look at these things in not so much an abstract manner, but uh, a more practical manner because, you know, again, I'm no philosopher. I, I'm just, I'm fascinated by philosophy, but there's no stretch of the imagination that I'm a philosopher. But I think that these issues are important to everybody every day because I think, one, God has given us the ability to understand and model reality accurately. He's given us the faculties to do that. But I also think it's our responsibility. We have that also. We have a responsibility to understand the world as best we can and as accurately as we can, given the faculties God has given us and giving us all of the information that God affords us to piece this whole thing together so we can really understand what's going on out in the world. The reason why I think that is important is because so much information you get today is just straight up BS. From the news, uh, whether it be sports media, entertainment, whether it's quote unquote the hard news is what they call it today. Um, I'm convinced that it's all uh, a bunch of crap, propaganda and, and nonsense. And we'll get into that, not in, in this video. I tried to cram it into this video and the last time I did it, but it doesn't work. But we'll, we'll talk about how bad ideas are propagated. But this time I wanted to just focus on how do you determine what are good ideas and what are bad ideas? And I think there's a way to do it, specifically with this idea that we're going to talk about, and I introduced it, I think, last time, is the idea of Calvinism. Calvinism is an idea that is in theology, although it's hard for me to think of it as a theological idea. It just seems like an ideology that somehow has inserted its way into um, theological discussions. But it, again, this is just me. It doesn't seem in any way a theological idea. And the reason why is because it contradicts so much of what the Bible says, it seems to me. And I'm going to illustrate some of that for you today. Nevertheless, it's an idea that it's propagated. It's, it's got a lot of uh, force behind it, a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of the most uh, influential uh, spokesmen, who, you know, Christians. Um, there are a lot of them who really take to this idea. Not all of them. As a matter of fact, if I understand correctly, most don't. But the ones that you hear from the most are pushing this idea. So I thought it'd be important to look at it 
and see if there's a way that you can find out whether it's a good idea or a bad idea if there are some very characteristic things. And I think there are. So as I said before, what I'm not going to be doing is biblical exegesis. I'm not good at that, I'm not qualified to do that. And there are people who are, are more qualified to do that than me uh, by far. Again, I would direct you to Leighton Flowers, William Lane Craig, uh, specifically for this topic of Calvinism. But just in general, uh, William Lane Craig's website, uh, reasonablefaith.org, just chock full of information on almost any topic that you want to think of with regard to philo theology and philosophy, philology. <laughs> um, so I won't be doing that. That's for other sites. Uh, there's another site that I always, that I like is uh, Kevin Thompson uh, has a site called Beyond the Fundamentals. It's a fantastic website. There's so much information going on there. And, and, and Kevin Thompson seems to be able to you know, get information from the front of the Bible, the back of the Bible, and all these ideas, and, and he seems to understand them, or at least have some sort of a grasp on, on these ideas, because he's got charts and graphs, and it gets deep, 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 deep into the Greek, all that stuff. None of that's going to happen here. If that's what you're looking for, you need to go to Beyond the Fundamentals. It's a great channel. I, I like it, you know, even though I'm, I get lost a lot of times. Uh, but that's where this heavy, deep, technical, biblical, exegetical, Big terminology. He'll even talk about things like uh, what was it, memeology. He's got all kinds of philosophical ideas in there. What I'm going to do is just look at it from a very practical purpose. I'm a practical guy. I think things are simple, and I think that God also, while you can get into these, I mean, deep, 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 deep complexities uh, of reality, I think God also reveals the world to us in a very simple. Way. So again, knuckleheads like me can understand, which is nice. Um, so that's how I'm going to be looking at it. And I want to give you just the background of how I'm going to be looking at this particular idea, but just all of the ideas in general. And I think it, it's, it's very simple. And I got it from this book uh, that I mentioned last time called uh, The Resurrection of Theism by a guy named Stuart Hackett. Uh, Stuart Hackett was a philosopher probably early, early in the 19th century or the 20th century. I'm not sure what century it is. I think it's the 20th century. I always get the centuries wrong because there's one off. Um, but he, uh, he wrote a book because at this time, theological ideas apparently were not considered suitable for academia. You know, those are religious things that religious people talk about, but they really have no effect on the real world. Well, Stuart, Stuart Hackett's assertion is, is that God and, or the Christian worldview specifically, is really the central point that you need to start from if you really want to understand reality. But he also has some rules for regarding all of these kinds of ideas. And when I read the book, what I liked about it was a couple of things. One was, it's always nice when you have kind of a sense of something, and then you're reading a book and somebody who's, you know, much smarter than you has already fleshed it out, you know, in some, in some books. So that's, that's always encouraging when that happens. Um, but secondly, I think there's just something sensible and right about it. And one of the ideas that I've had recently as I've been looking at these things is that, you know, if something isn't logical, then I don't think it can be biblical. And that's kind of a, a rule of thumb for me. If, if there's something that's just somebody's given me some, you know, thing about the Bible and there are just open contradictions in it, then I just simply reject that as false. And Calvinism is an idea that 30 years ago when I encountered it, more than 30 years ago now, unfortunately, um, when I first heard it, I just thought, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense. Not only does it not resonate with who I have understood to God to be, uh, but there's just, just straight up logical contradictions. It doesn't seem like we should be doing the things we're doing if what they're telling us is true. And so I just kind of wrote it off. Uh, but as I say recently, as I've been looking at, you know, philosophers and, and theologians and their ideas, I came across James White, who led me back into this topic, because James White, whatever you think about him, brilliant guy. He's no dummy. So when he was promoting Calvinism or, or asserting that Calvinism was true, I had to take a second look. And then I found out guys like uh, other big guys on the web who I'm not really that familiar with, but uh, people like, um, who is it? Uh, Piper. I was going to say Packer, but I don't think Packer is one. Uh, Piper, uh, Sproul. Sproul. I didn't know he was a Calvinist, but I, but I know he was big back in the day when I, when I first became a Christian. He was a huge, huge 
huge, huge guy. He had books all over the place. But I didn't know he was a Calvinist. Um, but just recently, Vody Bosham, who I don't know what bad thing you can say about Vody Bosham. He's smart, brilliant. I, I love his book, Fault Lines. But when I found out that he was a Calvinist, too, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I missed something uh, and had to give it a, a second look. Um, and so as I began looking at it from, from their perspective, from people like Sproul and, and the people that I mentioned, um, and I got to tell you, it's, <laughs> it's hard for me to take this idea seriously. Because even the best of the best, the people that I mentioned, and again, I'm not familiar with Piper or MacArthur that, that, that much. I just know that they're you know, big on the internet today. And I don't know anything negative about them. But when I hear them talk about it, 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 it gets worse. Because the problems that, that, I, heard, that, I, um, that I encountered initially when I heard the idea don't get explained when you listen to these talks. The, 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 the way they respond to these, if they even do respond, because oftentimes the biggest folks, the, the smartest people, the most popular advocates of this, this ideology, really just avoid a lot of the hard issues. And, and I'll show you an example of, of what I came across today. Not today, but today I'll show you what I came across during, when I'm researching this topic. But sometimes they just outright either miss it, avoid it, don't even deal with these deep, deep contradictions, or at least what it seems like to me. And so I just want to show you why it's, it seems very difficult to think, for me to think of Calvinism as anything but a very bad idea. But let me give you just the framework. Um, I was talking about Hackett's book. Hackett in the back of the book sets up this idea that logic and reason are really going to be the foundation for, for how you understand uh, ideas. It says the Christian worldview both needs and embodies a thoroughgoing rational apologetic as a manifestation of its relevance to the contemporary mind. And this is an allusion to the fact that I said, at this time, people were saying that, you know, Christianity was just, you know, thing for, for religious people. It's not something that rational people, academia, the real world, it's not a real world idea. It's just for Christians and folks like that. And Hackett is going, no, that's not the case at all. It says, Christian faith should be defended in terms of criteria which center in rational objectivity as the norm of truth and evaluation. So what Hackett is laying out this idea is that there's this very clear line between reality, things that you can consider as true, or possibly true, or at least consider the idea, and something that's just totally irrational. There's a line between what is real and a line between what is just, is just fantasy land basically. And that's going to be just rational thought, logic, reason, rationality. And again, when I'm saying this, if I can figure it out, anybody can figure it out because I'm not that smart. He's just basically talking about rules that you probably, I shouldn't say probably, I'm certain that you use these same logical rules every day in every aspect of your life. When you're getting to work, when you're going to get change at the store, when you're buying stuff at the store, you're using these basic these basic rules of, of uh, rationality. And what Hackett is saying is that when you're talking about the Christian faith, the center of that needs to be rational thought. So inside the book, and I've done this before, but this bears repeating because I think it's very, very important because I just want you to know the framework that I'm approaching this, this idea at um, through. Is that where it starts? Oh, okay, no, this, I start, this is not the first one. Here it is. So Hackett says, if a statement about the real world is self-contradictory, it is false. Okay. So he's setting up a very clear line. It's not like, well, maybe it's, you know, it, it's a, this kind of an idea or it's that kind of idea. What he's saying is that if you can find internal contradictions, it's simply false. You don't even have to go any further considering this idea. He says, and this not merely in the sense that the statement is internally absurd, but also in the, the sense that it is a false account of the real world itself. So it doesn't even exist in reality. He goes on to say, if I could, oh, here we go. For if we assert that a self-contradiction is true, then we're rejecting a principle upon which the possibility of any assertion at all rests, namely, that a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same manner. That's the law of 
non-contradiction, if I'm getting that correct, which I may not. If this principle is false, the principle he's talking about is that, you know, you can't have A and not A in the same idea. You got to pick one or the other. He says, if this principle is false, no knowledge is possible, not even the knowledge that a contradiction is true, as well, in that case, to be a non-rational amount of dirt as a thinking man. So what, what I think um, Hackett is getting at here in very explicit terms is, listen, either you're talking about something that's in the real world and we can discuss it as a possible good idea, or you're talking about something that's in fantasy land, something that you just don't even need to consider because it cannot possibly exist. Not that it's false or that it's wrong or that maybe it's just another way of thinking about the world. That's not what Hackett is saying. What Hackett is saying is that if you have something that has internal inconsistencies, internal contradictions, you got to get rid of it. It's, it's not worth considering because it cannot possibly exist in a real world. So with that in mind, let's go to the, this article. And, and I want to set it up this way. To make what I just read, it could be a bit abstract for some people, but let's, let's make this a real idea. So if you walked into work and uh, a buddy of yours, you know, you're talking about so-and-so, another person who works with you. And your buddy goes, you know, that, that Joe over there always wears, uh, always wears a red tie to work. He, he never comes to work without wearing a red tie. He's always wearing one. I don't care what time of day, he's wearing a red tie. Okay. Now, if he's saying, the, saying this to you, and then you go, well, you know what? Last week, I remember he was actually wearing a blue tie. There was no red in it whatsoever. Right? And then maybe a week later after he told you that, you see him and he's not even wearing a tie at all at work. You've got a logical inconsistency. You have a self-contradiction. What your friend told you cannot be true, and your observations also be true. So either you have to go, well, if he's wearing a red tie, when I saw a blue tie, I must have really been seeing a red tie. Or when I saw him and he had no tie on at all, there must have been a tie there, a tie there. I just wasn't able to perceive it because of some other thing. You got to make some, you have to reconcile this, in, this contradiction. And if you're not going to say that, well, what I'm seeing, what I'm observing, isn't false. I'm going to take that as reliable data. Then I have to say that my, what my friend is saying just simply isn't true. And if you talk to your buddy and go, you know, I know you said that, that he wears a, a red tie all the time, but you know, I saw him last week and he had a red tie. And then the week after you told me that he wasn't wearing any tie at all. Now your friend has a problem. Maybe. He, he has two choices. He can reconcile the contradiction between what he said and what you saw by saying something like, well, maybe, you know what, I, I didn't mean it, you know, like that. I was just being hyperbolic, you know, just making it interesting. I didn't mean every single time. I'm just saying most of the time, you know, generally, you'll always see him with a tie. That's what I really meant, but not every single time. Now, he's resolved the conflict, and you can continue to think of your person as a rational thinking person, this, this buddy of yours. Why? Because he saw the contradiction and he goes, okay, you're right. I, I need to back off my, my statement. I, 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 can't, I can't be so, you know, dogmatic about it. I'm just going to back off. What I really meant was this. And then now you can continue your conversation about it. But if he says, I don't care what you saw, he always wears a red tie. He never doesn't wear a red tie. If he's going to be absolute about that, then you have to consider your friend may have a problem that he's just not in the real world. Or he thinks you're a liar and you're not reliable. But, but my point is, the conflict hasn't been resolved. So either you don't see what you think you see, or your friend is out of touch with reality because he's asserting something that's true that you have evidence it's not true. And so you have to make a decision. Maybe my friend just simply isn't reliable when he's talking about what people wear to work. Maybe he's great on other things, but as far as that goes, I just don't listen to him because he's just not reliable in that respect. Okay, I think that's what Hackett is talking about. When, when people are telling you something and there are internal inconsistencies, logical contradictions, and they're not resolved, then you can just dismiss it as probably, it's not something that you really need to take seriously. Okay, so with that, Let's look at this article, if I can bring it up. 
Um, this is an article that I found on the Gospel Coalition website, which I think, I don't know. I've only read a couple of, of things on there, so I, I can't say this for sure. But a lot of them seem to really like Calvinism as an idea. Determinism, the tulip stuff, you find a lot of that on this website. Um, so it may not be just about the gospel, the Bible. It might be just a Calvinist website, but we'll see. Don't, don't quote me on that. I've just only seen a few, a few articles on it. So the question that they're considering is why pray if God has already decided everything, okay? Now, why is that an issue? Well, a couple of the tenets of Tal Calvinism, uh, one of them is determinism. That's a big, that's one of the big, uh, what do you call it? Tent poles, I guess, I don't know, of Calvinism. Now, Calvinists express their determinism, determinism by the name sovereignty of God. That's what they, they say. What they mean is determinism, okay? Now, determinism, seems to be an idea that, that says that everything you do, it's not you. There's something behind you that makes you do what you do so that you're not even in control. You think you're in control. You think your thoughts are your own. You think that you just came up with an idea to go have a sandwich or go take a dip in the pool. What the determinist will tell you is that's not true. But the, the determinist will tell you is something else Put that thought in your head. And, and this is key, there was no other possible action that you could have taken at that moment. That's how extreme this idea is. Now, as I understand it, as I've read about it, um, the determinism that Calvinism is talking about is theistic determinism, okay? This seems to be an idea that's exactly like a atheist idea. So materialists or physicalists, or I guess there's other name for atheists, who believe that there's only matter and energy, just things that you can, you know, look at under a microscope or manipulate in the lab. Those are the only things that really exist, um, things that you can observe with your five senses. So a spiritual world doesn't exist for them. So that rules out God. So a determinist in the atheist sense of the word thinks that it's just nature, from the beginning of the world or whatever, you know, depending on who you're talking to, there's different versions of it. But basically, there's the mechanistic, deterministic functioning of the world like a watch, and it just moves, and everything from way back into eternity, whatever it had happened had some sort of effect like dominoes from, from the past. Every domino falls as it was determined to fall, and nothing else could have happened. So while atheists use the physical world as the thing that determines your behavior, you know, they'll also go with your synapses and, and you know, your biological functions. Um, Calvinists go a step back. And instead of being the physical world, they'll take a step back to God who created the physical world and say God is the one who determines everything that you think of. And so I just want you to get... Uh, a flavor of what they mean when they're talking about determinism because it's important to think about this when we're reading the article. So this is a, um, another website. This is from a, a guy, I think it's his own you know, website that he put together. Um, and what he has is he's got uh, Calvinist quotes on God determining all evil specifically. Now the reason why this is important is because again, if God determines all things, like the Calvinists would say, then evil be one of those things that God has determined. But it goes further than just determining evil in the sense that he created this evil, this thing called evil, and human beings of their own free will take up this evil and do bad things. That's not what the Calvinist is saying when he says determines evil. So what uh, this gentleman, I say gentleman, might be a woman, I don't know. I should look at that, huh? Oh, it doesn't say. Anyway, whoever wrote this article took what he thought were Calvinist quotes that exemplify the, um, the determinism. And he starts off by saying, Calvinism is a belief in meticulous divine determinism over every thought, choice, and even throughout human history, I'm sorry, and uh, event throughout human history even. 
Uh, according to John Piper, this includes every one of your personal besetting sins. I don't know what that even is. Uh, just think about this insidious, and, and the guy goes on to say, just think about the insidious implications of such a view. If a rapist or pedophile were to declare in a courtroom, God caused me to do it, we would denounce him as a liar or a lunatic. However, when a Calvinist declares um, more or less the same thing, and I wouldn't say more or less the same thing, exactly the same thing, that's what I would say. Behind their pulpit, sub substituting cause for decreed or determined, he's extolled as being biblical. So that's the problem. You, you, if you're going to say that God has determined everything in this very, and they say meticulous, it's, for me, it's easier to understand it as absolutely nothing happens that God didn't actually make happen like his hand moved it to every molecule. Okay, so nothing moves, nothing thinks, nothing does anything unless God makes that happen. That's a better way. That's how I think about it. Because the meticulous part is fine, but... I don't. I, I had to look that up. <laughs> um, so the the other looking at it sort of a negative from the negative sense is is a, a better way for me to look at it. So he goes on to some of the quotes. This is John Calvin. Hence we maintain by his providence, not heaven and earth, uh, and inanimate creatures only, but also the counsels and wills of men are so governed as to move exactly in the course which he has destined. Okay. Um, here's another one. Men do nothing save at the instigation of God and do not discuss and deliberate on anything but what he has previously decreed with himself and brings to pass by his secret direction. The hand of God, oh, here's another one. The hand of God rules the interior affections no less than it superintends the external actions. Nor would God have affected by uh, the hand of man what he decreed unless he worked in their hearts to make them will before they acted. So those are just a few of the quotes that uh, this person wrote down in this article. And it just gives you just a sense of what Calvinists are talking about when they're saying God decreed. They will say God decreed everything from the, from the past. Some will say he does it moment to moment, however it goes. But you have to understand. When the Calvinist is talking about the sovereignty of God, what he's saying is that there's absolutely nothing you think, say, do, feel, anything that God didn't actually make happen. So you don't have your own thoughts. God has your thoughts. You don't have a desire. God has your desires for you. He puts your desires for whatever you do in you. Okay? That's what's going on. Nothing happens. Zero. That God didn't make happen. That's where they're coming from, okay? Pretty absolute, right? That doesn't seem like there's any wiggle room in there. Not to me. Kind of like the guy wearing the, the red tie. But let's go back to the article. So the question that, that's coming up, and, and many, many, many people, even Calvinists and non-Calvinists, have this question. Why would I even be praying if God has already decided everything, right? Because one of the ideas that, that comes from this divine determinism is, is the idea, it's the idea that um, God prede predestination, so, that, so they shoot this determinism into, the, into predestination, which the Bible talks about. But again, as I understand predestination, it's nothing like what the Calvinists say, but, you know, people see it differently. Um, but they shoot the determinism to the predestination part, which, which means that, so before God created anything, anything, no universe, no nothing, he had already determined that there's a, gonna be a select group of people who are gonna go to heaven, okay? And then the vast majority of everybody else are going to hell. Nobody had done anything. Nobody even existed at that point, or maybe they existed, I don't know. But the point is that you hadn't done anything yet, and you've already been determined to go to hell or to go to heaven. Now, to me, when I hear that, that seems like a wacky idea. That, that, that there's, it's, it's a very difficult idea just on its face to, to consume. But, but that's not enough. I, I, I want to give you the, the reasons why. But I, I just want to let you know, these are the ideas. So you're predestined to go to heaven or to go to hell. Okay. Now, there's necessary implications of that that I don't think either Calvin thought about or the people who adopt this idea think about. 
that are the, you know, some of the first things that come to my mind. For example, the Bible seems to talk a lot about lost people. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, uh, you know, heaven rejoices more over the one lost sheep than the 99 that are found or already not lost. I'm not sure how it goes. Not a Bible guy. Not don't understand the Bible as best, as good as it goes. Um, but it seems to indicate that there are people who are lost. And, and the idea behind lost, it seems to me, is that there's this tension that, that it may not be found. Because if there is no tension that the lost person, the lost thing may not be found, then was it ever really lost? Right? If you, if you picked up, you know, your cell phone or you had a coffee cup or something like that, if I, if I lost my mouse, then that means that I don't know where it is and I don't know that I'll ever find it again. There's that tension there. Okay? But if I was predestined from the beginning of the world, I shouldn't use myself. If somebody was predestined from the beginning of the world to go to heaven, and that could not have not happened, then at what point were they lost? Right? If I put my wallet down because I'm going to go you know, run fives at the gym, and then I put it in my locker, then after I finish playing basketball, I come back, and it's there where I left it. When was it lost? It was never lost. And so it seems to me that this concept of predestination, if God has chosen people from the beginning of time, and will save them, and they're going to heaven, and nothing can change, then there's no such thing as lost. Everybody that he had planned were going to go to heaven, going to go to heaven, and there's no point at which that wasn't going to happen. And so then the only lost people, God didn't lose them. He tossed them away. There's no chance that they will be found. Well, that's not lost. Those are people you've thrown away. And you know where they are. So the concept of lost, being found, to me, it just blows up once you do determinism and predestination. That's how it seems to me. And I don't know, after reading many Calvinists, I don't know what the answer is for that. I, I couldn't go, oh, I saw Piper, and he wrote, oh, this is how that works out. I haven't heard, I haven't seen that. Right? I, I, have, I haven't listened to the dividing line with James White. And I go, oh, now James White makes sense of this. Now it makes perfect sense. I couldn't show you that video. So these are some of the problems that come up when you talk about determinism. For, you know, listen, not even the lost. What about disobedience? Right? When, when you read, uh, like this gentleman wrote on, 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 on his article, that, uh, what is it? The hand of God rules the interior affections no less than it superintends internal actions, nor would God have affected by the hand of man what he decreed unless he worked in their hearts to make them will before they even acted. Well, if that's true, who's disobeying God? If, 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 again, if every single thing that you're doing, any thought you have, any movement you make, is God's decree making you do it, well, who's disobeying God? Doesn't sound like anybody. It seems like the, the, the idea of disobedience is gone now. Every single person is doing exactly what God wants them to do. Exactly what God wants them to do. If this determinism thing is true. And there's so many things like that. I don't even want to go into them, but I was starting to make a list, and I got down to like six or seven things that if, if this determinism is true, if this predestination is true as the Calvinist construes it, there are things in the Bible that just totally evaporate as concepts. Disobedience, right? I think evil is gone. Suddenly, really, what, what, what is actually evil when God is making you do it? I mean, I mean is, is evil still a thing? I think it is. But if you've got God doing it, and God can't do anything that's evil, it just seems like a conflict to me. And, and it's funny because I... I'll get into that later because I don't want this to go on again. I don't want to have to do this yet another time. So, so the point I'm making is that it seems as though if you take the Calvinist at his word, then there are so many things in the Bible that can't be true. And that's how you get a question like, if God determined everything, then why should I even pray? Because there are no lost people to pray for. Anytime that I do pray, it's because God made me pray. And so, I don't know. 
Everybody who's going to be saved is going to be saved. They're not going to not be saved. So, so the point is, what's all the prayer for? Why are we doing it? Because it seems like everything now is just a formality. Or at least that's a question that could come into your mind, I think, reasonably, if you're taking the Calvinist seriously. So in the article, he says, why should we pray if God has fixed the future? If God has predestined every event, how do we reconcile that fact you know, listen, I may be nitpicking. I don't know that you put fact in there. You know, when you're in philosophy, when you're presupposing things, when you're looking at ideas and examining them, you know, if I was going to say, well, if two plus two is four, how do I reconcile that fact? I don't know that you really, that's necessary to say. It's okay to just say, if two plus two equals four, then how do we reconcile this with whatever the conflict it is you're trying to resolve? But when you're calling it a fact, to me, it seems like you're sort of poison in the well. In my opinion, I, I may be overthinking it. I may be being nitpicky about it, but it seems like that that addition of the term fact uh, kind of poisons the well because uh, determinism is anything but a fact. And it seems like a philosopher would have understood that. But anyway, it is how do we um, reconcile that fact with the power of prayer to actually change things? And he goes and he quotes James 15 or he references James 15, which uh, indicates that you pray to change things, which I think is biblical. And, I, and, and in my opinion, I don't think you can reconcile predetermination with the power of prayer to change things. I don't think it's reconcilable, but let's see what he has to say. He says, the answer is found in the right understanding of God's providential determination. Now, I don't know what that means, and I'm not sure how that's significant, but hopefully he will explicate this. It's important to distinguish between determinism and fatalism. Most Calvinists believe in a form of determinism. That is, God has determined every single event. At each moment, there is only one possible future, the future that God has determined. This is not to be confused with fatalism. Fatalism is, fatalism is the view that our choices don't affect the future. Uh, some Christians, both Calvinists and non-Calvinists, think God's providence is um, in this incorrect way. If God has determined every future event, then my choices don't affect the future. Now, it seems what, what um, this, the, guy, the, article, the guy who's written the article's name is Rizkala, his last name. There's a couple of things. Again, I, I mentioned the part that, you know, establishing uh, determinism as a fact, I don't know that that's necessary or responsible, in my opinion. It, it would be simple enough to go, if determinism is true, then X, Y, Z. Um, but again, that might not, I may be overthinking that, that may not be a, a, an issue. But it seems like he immediately goes to talking about the, the difference between fatalism and determinism. Okay, let's, let's dig in. Fatalism is this idea that whatever happens is the only thing that could have happened. Basically, that's what it is. Everything that happens was determined to happen, and there was no other possibility for that to happen. You couldn't have not made a different choice other than the one you made. So if you want a hamburger, you couldn't have not chosen to have a hamburger. That's what fatalism says. Whatever you do, you are fated to do that and nothing else could have happened. Now, here's the thing. The difference between fatalism and determinism is, seems to be just this, is that fatalism doesn't presuppose determinism. Fatalism, you could be a fatalist and just think that people make their own choices. You just think that whatever choice they end up making, they couldn't have made a different choice but it doesn't mean that it was determined by something beyond that person. Determinism, in my opinion, is fatalism with determinism because the end result is the same. You have an event that occurs and could not have happened in any other way. It's just that the determinist says that it was determined by something beyond the person. That seems to be the only difference. I'm not a philosopher, I could have read it wrong, um, but that's how it seems to me. And as a matter of fact, if you want to get into this topic, the best resource I found was uh, Dr. William Lane Craig has a book called The Only Wise God. Uh, it's hard to read there. It says, but the, the compatibility of divine foreknowledge and human freedom. Um, that, that book gives a very good ex uh, um, explanation of determinism, fatalism, and you know, foreknowledge and, and freedom, which is where this whole thing comes up. Whereas if God knows everything, how does he know everything? And Calvinists has come up with the idea that, well, he must have caused everything. That's the only way he could know. Which, you know, okay, uh, there seem to be better answers to that. And again, I would refer you to uh, Dr. Craig's book, but that's the one that the Calvinists have settled upon. The only way God could know the future is that he caused the future. That's, that's what I 
have heard from many Calvinists. But again, if you're going to go that way, and, and I can hear Calvinism, Calvinists screaming out there, we're not fatalists. We're determinists, but we're not fatalists. It seems the same thing to me. But again, I could be wrong, and I'm, and I'm open to, be, to, to learn in the right way, if I'm wrong. But notice this, and this is what I noticed about this article as I was reading it. The question isn't really about determinism and fatalism. The question is, very simple, if everything that is going to happen is determined by God to happen, then what am I praying for? So the question isn't, is, is fatalism determinism? That seems to be a red herring in this thing. Nobody asked about fatalism or determinism. What they're asking the question, and it's a very simple question. If person A, from the beginning of time, was going to go to heaven and that could not have changed, no matter what, what am I praying for? Because even the prayer that I'm praying was also fated by God. So, so it's like, again, God set up a bunch of dominoes from the beginning of time, and we're just falling as we were set up to fall. So again, this pr so, so I guess what I'm saying is, and I'm not going to go through the whole article because it, it goes on a little bit, but we'll get back to it later because there's some other things that I think um, should be highlighted. But I think the real question here is, if God determines everything, then the question is, where, where he says here at the, the bottom of the paragraph, says, if God has determined every future event or every event, then my choices don't affect the future or anything. Okay. Well, the question is not about determinism or fatalism. The, the, the key word is choices. Okay. If God determines everything, then what in fact are choices? Because according to the Calvinists and those quotes that I read before, there's no room for choices. Every single thought that I have is determined by God. Where does the choice come in? Because the way I understand choices is, is that I, as an individual, as a thinking, rational person, get to make a decision between one or more options. I can pick this one or I can not pick this one. I can pick this one or I can not pick this one. And there may be many more that I could pick or not pick. Calvinism said that's impossible. Calvin himself is saying that every single thought is, what is it saying? Oh, I got to find it again. It says, uh, where was the one? This is the one. Okay. Men do nothing save at the secret instigation of God. Where's the room for choices in that? They do not discuss, deliberate on anything but what he has previously decreed with himself and brings to pass by his secret uh, direction, okay? And so what I'm wondering is, what's, what's a choice at that point when God determines every single thing? Here's another quote from um, uh, R.C. Sproul. This is how a lot of other Calvinists... Explicated. You'll hear this in, in a lot of Calvinist preachings because they, they love to, well, whatever. It says, if there's one single molecule in this universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. Okay. That doesn't seem like there's a whole room for choice. At least not the way Sproul seems to indicate that. Now, here's the thing. I agree with what he's saying. I, don't, I think it's impossible that there is a rogue molecule. Why? Because God, when I think of God's sovereignty, I think of God's sovereignty like uh, the dictionary version, like every, you know, every time that I've ever heard it, it just means that he's the guy who sets up the rules. God sets up the rules. Supreme power or authority, authority over state or government, a self-governing state. But basically, when I think of sovereignty, it seems to me just you get to set the rules. Right? Mom and dad, they're sovereign over their home if they're running the house right. Your mom and dad are running the house right, they're sovereign. They get to make the rules. Doesn't mean that every single thing that happens in that you do that they're controlling. That's not sovereignty to me in any rational sense of the word. I've never heard that. As a matter of fact, I've never heard that take on the word outside of Calvinism. You, when you go to work, 
whoever is the, the, the authority at work, that's the sovereign, right? It could be your boss and your little group or the company as the whole, whoever's the company owner or group of people who own the company, that's sovereign. It just means that you set up the rules and nothing happens there that you don't want to happen. And if it does, you fix it. Right, my mom and dad were sovereign over the home. When it was time to come home, you get it, you got it, had to be home before the lights came on. And if I'm out playing and, and I see it's dark and I'm in trouble, well, listen, my mom and dad are still sovereign even though I didn't get home the time that they told me to. They're still sovereign. Just means that I got a problem when I get home. That's all. Right, if you're at work, and you take a two hour lunch and you're only supposed to have an, an hour lunch break, does that mean that the boss is no longer in control? No, it just means that you got a problem when you get back from lunch. So, so sovereign, again, I, this is just me. I've never encountered this, this wacky idea that sovereignty means nothing is outside of the control. Every little molecule. That seems like a perverse idea of sovereignty in my book. Anytime I ever think of sovereignty, it just means that's the person who makes the rules. That's the boss. And however they want to make up the rules, they get to make up the rules the way they want to make the rules. However, and for me, this molecule idea, God set up the laws of physics. And so the molecules operate under the laws of physics. That's God's law. That's God's sovereignty. But, but moving where the molecule goes... <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I don't even know how you can get that in a real rational world. So this rogue molecule thing, and I've heard it from more than one person who, who quoted, you know, this. I just don't think it's a smart thing to say if you're, really, if you're a rational thinking person. That's just not a smart thing to say, at least the way I think he meant it. Now, if he meant it and just, you know, yeah, there's no such thing as a rogue molecule. I, I agree with that. That's impossible. But I don't think that's the way he means it. So. We have this idea of, uh, I'm sorry, that's not what I was going to So we have this idea of determinism from the Calvinist, Calvinist perspective that absolutely nothing happens that God didn't make happen for whatever reason. Now, they will say his good pleasure and his glory. But again, when you look at some of the horrific things that go on in the world, it's, it's difficult to say that that horrific act, and I'm not going to get into the horrific act, but you, you name it. You, if you're watching the news, you watch, you know. I don't watch the news, so I don't, I'm, I'm not in on that. But whatever horrific act happened, you would have to say God did that for his glory. That, that's why I think, I, and as I looked at this, I get the idea that I, don't, I really don't think Calvinists really believe this stuff. That, that's, that's really, that, listen, I was going to do that in another video. I'm giving it to you now, because it's hard to talk about some of these wild contradictions, these wild inconsistencies with, with what they say and what the real world does that seem obvious and unavoidable that Calvinists just seem to look past. And I don't think they really believe it. If, if you did, then you wouldn't pray. Or if you did pray, you'd think, well, God's making me pray. You, you see what I'm saying? The real answer to that article is we pray because God makes us pray. That's the answer. But he goes into fatalism, determinism, and all these things that really have nothing to do, in my opinion, with what the question that's being asked. There are no choices. No choices at all if Calvinism is true. Everything you do is because God made you do it. So why do you pray? Because God's making you do it. That's it. It's pretty simple. So let's look at this from a different perspective. So I talked about the guy with the tie, the red tie at work. Guy's got a, somebody says that this guy always wearing a red tie. And if he's going to use that in absolute terms, he's not just being hyperbolic, just not, you know, kind of making it interesting, but he doesn't really mean every single time. But if he means every single time and he's using it in an absolute sense, all you need is one example. You just need one example of this guy not wearing a red tie. And now this person who's asserting that he always has a, wears a red tie, he's got a problem. There, there's something that he's got to fix. Either he has to back off on being so dogmatic about the every single time thing and just go, well, you know, I just meant it in general terms. Or he's in a weird place. Still love him. People, you know, people got all kinds of crazy ideas about a lot of crazy things. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means on that particular topic, they're off in some fantasy land. 
And you probably shouldn't take it seriously when he says things, at least on that topic. Or at least you might want to reconsider taking him serious on those things. So when Calvinists say that God determines every little event, it seems to me that I just need one example of God not determining every single event, just having one rogue molecule out there. And then it seems that Calvinism itself has a problem. It has this internal contradiction that Hackett says, if you have this contradiction, if something's self-contradictory, and you can't resolve that, that contradiction, it's probably not true. Okay. So I came across this verse, and I didn't come across it. I was watching, I think it was probably Dr. Flowers on, on Soteriology 101, and, and he read this verse, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's pretty clear. It says, this is verse 4, uh, Jeremiah uh, 19, 4, 4, 5. I think this is the NIV version, but you know, for anybody who cares. It says, for they've forsaken me and made this place... I'm sorry, made this a place of foreign gods. They've burned incense in it to gods that neither they nor their ancestors nor kings of Judah ever knew. And they filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built for themselves, I'm sorry, they've built the high places of Baal to burn their children in fire as offerings to Baal. Now, just stop right there. Okay, that's more than one rogue molecule. Okay, this is a whole lot of rogue molecules, if I'm reading it right. Because it sounds like God isn't happy with this. This is not something that God is happy with, it seems to me. And there's a whole lot of rogue molecules. Not even for a moment, but this seems like this is something that happened over weeks, maybe. Right? Maybe months, maybe years. I don't know. But, but it's far more than just one rogue molecule. And so the question is, uh, did, is God the one who's behind this? Well, this is what it says in the, in, the, in the end of the verse. It says, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. I don't know how you can be stronger in that statement. I don't know how Calvinists look at this verse. I don't know what they think about when they read it. I don't know what they've been told to think about when they read it. But as I'm reading it, I don't know how you can, you can strong, make a stronger denial that you had anything to do with a particular event. Right? You know, imagine that you're in, in, in a classroom or you're at work and there's some people goofing off over there and the boss comes in or the teacher comes in and goes, well, what's, what's going on over there? You can't be doing that. You're messing the place up. And they look at you and they go, well, you have anything to do with this? And you go, this is, I didn't command it. I, I didn't mention it. This never even came into my mind. I, I, don't, I don't know a stronger denial than that. So when I read that, God saying himself, I had nothing to do with these knuckleheads. They were acting crazy. They were doing all kinds of stuff that I didn't like. I had nothing to do with it. That's what it sounds like to me. So when a Calvinist says, nope, God determines every single event, I, I've got a choice now. I can go by what, again, I, I term historically reliable data. That's the Bible for me. And if I hear somebody saying something that I can't fit with what the Bible says, then I just have to reject it as, as false. Because to me, that's an internal, that's a self-contradictory statement. That God determines everything, but God doesn't determine everything. At least this one event, God didn't determine. That's a self-contradiction, it seems to me. And so I have a choice. Either God doesn't determine every event, every thought, every action, right? Or the Calvinist is true and God is lying to me here. Or God's just not reliable when he says that. And so that's what it seems to me. That, that's, that's the problem that, that I think you have when you make such universal dogmatic statements. So here's another verse that I ran into. Again, and, and you have to understand, <clears throat> I want to make this clear. I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm not, I'm not an exegeter. I made that, hopefully I made that clear at the beginning of this. But I, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says. I think you're responsible to figure that out for yourself. Because, you know, I'm not going to be standing in front of you on that last day. Um, but this is something that when I read it, Again, I, I have the same problem. If I'm going to believe what the Calvinist says, if I'm going to believe these quotes by John Calvin and Piper and folks like that, 
and scroll, then I'm going to have a problem when I come to this verse. At least I do. And, and if this is something even before Calvinism I always thought was odd because this is God in Genesis. And he says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the, the human race had become on the earth. This is also in IV. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Okay. And this is the verse here. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. And every time I read that, I'm like, well, what's, I mean, God, you know, what would he be sad about? He's God. He does everything exactly the way he wants. How could he do something and regret it? I found that always problematic. Now, I do things all the time and regret it. So it's not like it's a foreign concept to me. I'm just saying, how can God, the maximally perfect being, do something and then regret it? Well, if I'm going to take the Calvinist spin on it, then everything that every human being was doing, all of that evil, God determined that. So God determines humans do things and then regrets what he had determined humans to do. That seems like a contradiction. It, it, it makes God seem a bit crazy, to be quite honest, or just inept. Because again, that's what I do. You know, I'm trying to get something done. I, 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 this, this thing, this, this is my fourth try at this. The, the last three times I get to the, I, I start doing the, the edit part and I look at it, I'm like, no, that's not going to work. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fallible human being. I regret stuff all the time. Why would God regret something that he did and has meticulous control over? That's hard to reconcile, it seems to me. But if you look at it in a different sense, that God created this environment, this state of affairs, and put human beings who are free to make decisions, both good and bad, and they just made a lot of bad decisions, and you're like, then God's like, I'm just not going to have this. Moses, you go wait over there. I got to wash. I'm going to wash this off a little bit, and then you can come back in. That makes more sense to me. You know, if, if you've got kids, may, maybe you bought some toy for your kids to play with or built a place in the, in the backyard that they can hang out, and they just start messing it up. Yeah, you're going to go back over there and, and, and redo something. Maybe you're going to take that toy away from them because they're not using it properly. Maybe you're going to you know, not let them play in that place anymore because they, they, they're abusing that place. They're making a lot of bad decisions. That makes sense to me. You, you, may have regret, you may regret getting them that toy or building that place for them because they just used it poorly. But if you're making them do everything that they do in this place, you're making them play with whatever it is that you got them and then you regret what they're doing, that seems twisted to me. That, that just seems totally illogical to me. And, and it's, I find it interesting that people who support this idea look at these verses and that doesn't seem to pop up into their mind. That how can God, who meticulously planned everything in their Calvinist minds, regret what he did? That seems twisted to me, if he's in control of everything. But if he's given the earth to humankind, if he's given the earth to man, and say, listen, I've created this place. This is yours. Make some good decisions. Don't make bad decisions. And they just go on making bad decisions. Yeah, I can see God going, knuckleheads, we're, we're going to start this over again. That makes sense to me. And so for me, I have not just one counterexample, but I've got two counterexamples. And I'm not even using these as proof texts. You, you know, when you, when you get into the, uh, when, you, when you listen to these kinds of debates, there's proof text wars going back and forth. It's not a proof text to me. This just seems to be what the Bible says. It, it, it says that here in Jeremiah, he had nothing to do with what those crazy people were doing. It seems to me in Genesis that it's impossible that God could make a mistake and do something himself that he regretted doing. That just seems impossible to me. So for me, at this point, I, I really don't need to hear anything else about Calvinism. I mean, I went further than this. Don't get me wrong. I, I wanted to... I wanted to hear the whole thing. But for me, as a concept that's in reality, this, this, isn't a, this isn't one of those things. For me, Calvinism simply isn't something that could be in reality, as far as I'm concerned. Why? There's, I've given you two contradictions. 
it's, it's, and I'm telling you, it's riddled with these kinds of just logical contradictions that I, I don't know what the answers to them are. I know they, they move off to another area and talk about it. Like this guy wanted to talk about fatalism versus determinism. You know, they don't talk about the obvious contradiction that choices isn't a thing if Calvinism is true. Didn't talk about that part. And so, the, it, to me, I think Hackett is correct that you cannot have uh, two ideas that are inconsistent and hold them both together. He, you know, I, I, did, I wasn't going to do this here. Maybe I can find it quickly because he has, he's got another quote that had to do with another topic that we'll get into, but I, I guess I can use it now also. Uh, but it's, it's about this idea of uh, mystery or antimony. Th this is what Calvinists will fall back on. They'll go, it's a mystery. When you go, if this is true, if that's true, how can that be true? They'll go, it's a mystery, right? It's so, you can't figure out, it's unsearchable. You know, I, I talked about, I think last time I mentioned, there's a woman who called in for this very same topic. Was, well, praying for my grandkids, but if they've already gone to heaven or not going to heaven, what, what, what am I even praying for? Right? And, and, the, and the guy who, who was on there, I've got to get this clip. I, I can't just keep quoting and not give you the clip. But the pastor was talking, Calvin's pastor, it's a mystery. Nobody can understand. Think about other things. Just pray about They just, that's what they do. And I think that that's a false, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the proper way to handle it. Uh, because again, and, and this, is, this, is a, this is a quote by Hackett that I think is a much stronger quote. Uh, but it talks about the idea that there's no, really no such thing as mystery. Hackett says this, um, this is on the next page, uh, page 39 of uh, the Resurrection of Theism. He says, there exists no real entity that does not yield itself to rational thought and analysis when the data pertinent to its being are presented in experience. He goes on to say, there are no incomprehensible realities, no realms of being that thought cannot conquer if she but encounters them. And I think what he's saying is, is that appeal to mystery, kind of a BS move, kind of a, <laughs> that's, that doesn't work. Why? Because two plus two, you know, if you say two plus two equals seven, that's not a mystery. It's just false. Now there may be mathematical concepts and principles that we just don't understand yet. But what Hackett is saying is that if we're presented with all of the data, then we should be able to work through it analytically. And if it's a real thing, it will be contradiction free. That's what he's saying. It's not that we've got a contradiction now and later on it'll, it'll be cleared up. No, no, no. If you've got a contradiction now and you can't clear that up, then you just get rid of the idea. What Hackett is talking about is if it's going to be a real thing, then even if you can't quite understand it, what you do understand is free of, of logical contradiction. And maybe when you get the rest of the information, it'll all make sense. Or maybe if you get more information, you might have to change what you think because a contradiction does pop into, into view. But as long as you're considering the idea, it has to be free of logical contradiction. Otherwise, you need to just toss it out. And that's a very strong statement. And I don't, know, I don't quite know if, I, if I'm down with all of it because uh, it's a very strong statement. But listen, it seems to be right. And I, and I don't have... I, don't, I haven't come across anything that would make this wrong. And if I do, I'll have to change that. But for, for right now, I think Hackett is on point. So again, if you really want to know the determinism, fatalism thing, go back to uh, this book, uh, William Lane Craig, The Only Wise God, um, The Compatibility of Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom. He does a great job of talking about the uh, determinism of fore, foreknowledge. It's a, it's a, it's a tough idea. But that's all I wanted to get into. I, that's, I'm going to end it right there. Thanks for listening, um, because this is, is a complicated thing. And I want to make this clear. I'm not trying to get anybody mad. I ain't trying to piss anybody off. You're a Calvinist, and you want to be a Calvinist. You got to do you. Okay? Uh, I'm simply saying, this is what I'm encountering as I'm looking at this idea. And, you know, <laughs> it's a fun idea. Uh, if nothing else, but it's just, it's hard to take it seriously because again, there are so many contradictions that are never dealt with, but it's, it's like in this article, at least as the article started out, it's like, Hey, look over here. Don't, don't talk about the problem. Let's look over here at this thing. Fatalism. 
it's not about fatalism. It had nothing to do with fatalism. So, well, maybe it did have something to do with fatalism. But, but the point was, if everything's determined, then there are no choices. That's really the point. But I'm going on too long. So uh, thanks for tuning in to Uncolored. Next time, we're going to look at a, a different aspect of this. And again, I don't want to hammer on Calvinists, but there are just some ideas that I think it's important to go through because it does illustrate. There are very great ideas out there, and they have a characteristic. There are some very poor ideas out there, and they also have very specific characteristics. And so I'm hoping that when you look at some of these ideas with me, you can start to see that, yeah, I, I know that's happened. That's happened at work. I've, I've, I've encountered that when I watch the news. I've encountered that at school when my, you know, my biology professor said that, you know, you can't be a Christian and a, uh, uh, and a scientist, right? You hear these kinds of nutty statements all the time. And I'm simply saying they all follow, it seems, a very regular pattern. And I just want to help you point those things out. And I'm sorry that Calvin is, is one of the things. But listen, I could be wrong. If, if somebody can go, no, Kev, you got it wrong. This is how Calvinism works. It's a fantastic idea. I'm more than open to hearing it. I just have not, I've just not encountered that yet. And, and that's just where I am. So thanks again for tuning in and color. Uh, I've said everything. Get out of here. That's enough out of you. All right, that's it.